Hello and uh, welcome to uh, module 11 lecture 1 part 2 um, of navigation. It is a warm day in Chennai, so I hope I do not sweat too much when talking now. All right, um, so in the previous lecture we saw some basics of navigation. Uh, so we saw some, uh, we discussed some really interesting story of Alexander's march, how desert ants um, search for food, how to do celestial navigation and so on. Uh, we briefly discussed uh, dead reckoning, celestial navigation, uh, coastal navigation and something about GPS and other things, although that was very brief. Uh, what we are going to do today is to dig a little bit deeper into uh, the basic, the first cut equations of dead reckoning and we will see why reference frames are very important. Okay? In the next lecture, I will actually show to you uh, the kind of errors that are induced because of dead reckoning all right? um, and those er errors are primarily because of sensor characteristics. Okay, very good. So, let us start. Um, inertial navigation. So, the reason why it is called inertial navigation is because we use sensors which respond uh, to Newton's laws. Okay? Uh, so, you, you consider an accelerometer or a gyroscope and these objects have a certain inertia like all physical objects and these objects they maintain their velocity either translational velocity for acceleration or angular velocity for the gyroscope, they maintain their acceleration and, and velocity unless they are disturbed by an external force that is Newton's inertia law. right? Uh, so, these sensors when they make the measurements, when they are disturbed by an external force, um, this is why they are called inertial sensors. All right. So, what do they actually measure? Well, they measure two things. One is the translational motion which is uh, say the motion of this object as it is going in a particular line. Right? So, it could either go straight, it could go left, right, up, down. All right? It could also measure the rotational motion and the rotational motion would basically be I have this aircraft and I have an angular motion with respect to an axis, I have this rotation and I have the third rotation. We will see a little bit more about this. So, since we live in a 3D world, we are always going to look at 3D translatory motion and 3D rotational motion. All right. Now, uh, there are various types of inertial sensors. The two sensors we will deal with in, uh, in this and the next series of lectures are the accelerometer and the gyroscope. Uh, we could also be doing the magnetometer, but uh, due to uh, lack of time, we will focus on just these two. So, uh, what does an accelerometer measure? Well, uh, loosely speaking, it measures the acceleration and the units of that is meters per second square. All right? um, an accelerometer is a very interesting object. So, whenever we talk of accelerometers or gyroscopes from this time onwards, we will be re referring to what are called as three axis uh, sensors. Right? And three axis basically means that because we live in a three dimensional world, um, we have motion along an axis, we can call it x axis, uh, we have a motion along a perpendicular to the x axis called the y axis, so that is in a plane and then perpendicular to the plane we have the z axis. In the literature they commonly do not call it as x, y and z, there are specific notations for this, we will see this a little bit later. But for now, uh, we only need to know that uh, motion uh, takes place in three dimensions and uh, each of these three axis sensors, they measure the motion along each of these axes. All right? It could be a gyroscope, it could be an acceler accelerometer as well. So, um, I have also included some links uh, for an accelerometer and for a gyroscope, uh, both are analog devices but there are plenty of other options as well. There is Invensense and uh, uh, there are Honeywell products and, and so on. This is just an example for you to see uh, what these products are about. A gyroscope measures the angular velocity. Okay? Uh, we will see this a little bit later what I specifically mean by this. Uh, so, uh, the, the gyroscope is used to measure the rotational uh, uh, behavior of an object. 
the accelerometer is used to is used to measure the translational behavior of an object all right um, historically accelerometers and gyroscopes would come as two independent products uh, for uh, maybe the last decade or two decades manufacturers have integrated these accelerometers and gyroscopes into a single device called a IMU okay IMU is basically an inertial measurement unit okay so you have these small chips which we shall uh, show you um, maybe in a couple of lectures with some experiments which one of my research associates Vinay Sridhar will be presenting. We will show you uh, the basic IMU uh, which are the sensors mounted in that um, and e examples of these okay. So we are going to be working predominantly with IMUs which have an integrated accelerometer and a gyroscope on board okay good. So let us look at a um, little bit of dead reckoning in the very basic sense. So, this slide is basically on dead reckoning all right. So, um, as I have said the general principle of navigation using inertial sensors is based entirely on dead reckoning. Uh, now, let us look at the example of accelerometers in this slide in the next slide we will go to gyroscope. So, what does an accelerometer measure? We saw that it measures the acceleration okay. So, here I have written uh, so let us say you have a 3 axis accelerometer okay we consider a single axis let us say the x axis you, you could also consider y or z and the measurement along that x axis x axis will simply we can denote it as um, we can denote the measurement along the x axis as simply acc underscore x and along the y uh, which I am not mentioning here would be acc underscore y along the z axis acc underscore z all right. So, let us say that we have made a measurement along the x axis and now we want to see how to compute position based on this. By the basic laws of physics we know that the integral of acceleration is nothing but velocity right uh, inverse of that is derivative of velocity is nothing but acceleration. So, obviously if you are if you are integrating along the x axis the velocity which you compute will be also along the x axis. Again from basic physics we know that the integration of velocity is nothing but position all right the position of the object and <clears throat> as before if you are integrating along x the position computed will also be along x. So, that is basically what this expression over here says right uh, which is basically the same as saying if you double integrate the acceleration what you are going to end up with is the position x right. Uh, we will do this okay. Um, so, now that we have seen the basic uh, say calculus of how we compute position from acceleration uh, all of you have done this in high school. Now, remember that our sensors are usually connected to microcontrollers right or, or, or to computers or to any electronic device. Uh, being computers and microcontrollers um, they can only take in discrete values of the actual data. So, if your real uh, let us say this is time axis this is the acceleration along let us say the y axis right. Um, so, let us say the vehicle was accelerating in that particular manner okay. When you um, actually try to convert this uh, or connect this sensor to a microcontroller you need to uh, pass it through a analog to digital converter right and depending on uh, the resolution of the analog to digital converter you actually get a 16 bit, 10 bit, 8 bit so on and so forth right. So, the accuracy increases with increasing resolution. So, with whatever accuracy uh, with whatever resolution we have taken we will be able to recover some parts of this data right. So, the complete curve is a true acceleration what your sensor is able to measure okay, are these points it cannot measure anything in between 
unless you increase uh, the sampling rate of the sensor and unless you increase uh, the resolution of analog to, uh, to, the uh, to the digital converter, all right. So, now in the discrete world or in the discrete time, so this is the continuous time. So, in the discrete time which as all of you know are nothing but samples, how will this look like? Uh, the measurement, so I will call it A C C Y actually measured or measured and then discretized and sampled, it will it will basically look like this right. That is going to be your measurement. Now, uh, this is the actual data which is going to come into your microcontroller. So, I would call this as say sample number 1, sample number 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Now, um, based on these measurements which we are taking, the acceleration measurements, our objective is to compute our position, right? That is the whole point of dead reckoning. Based on whatever you know in the past, you want to predict your future. So, based on the current acceleration, I would like to know what happens next. Or a different way of putting, based on the acceleration which I have measured now, I want to know where exactly I am. So, you have to double integrate the acceleration. How do you do this in the discrete world? Because uh, you, you are now inside a computer, your data has come inside your microcontroller or your computer. So, how would you actually compute this? Well, um, let us look at the basic e e equations first, right. So, we see that dv by dt, where v is the velocity, is nothing but your acceleration, okay. So, let us just take it along the x axis. Um, this is nothing but the limit uh, v x of t plus delta t minus v of t whole divided by, uh, by delta t is equal to acceleration x. Okay, we know this from basic calculus that the derivative is expressed as a limit uh, delta t tends to 0 blah blah blah. Sorry. Now, of course, in the discrete world, we do not have the have the delta t really tending to 0, it is really small, um, you know, it could be 0 0.01, maybe 0 0.0001 and so on, but it is never perfectly 0. So, let us fix the delta t uh, to a certain value, okay, we will just call it as delta t. It could be any number depending on how fast you are able to sample your signal, all right. So, we can remove the limit for now because it, it never really goes to 0 and you are left with this basic expression in the discrete time. How do I, uh, if I expand this expression, I will basically get V x of t plus delta t, okay, is equal to uh, V of t plus A c c x times delta t, right. This is your difference equation which uh, does the following. It uses the current information of the measured acceleration, note that this is a function of time. It uses uh, the current uh, velocity which is known from the previous calculation which we have done and it calculates the next velocity, okay. So, it predicts what the next position, uh, the next velocity is, is going to be. Now, I have expressed this slightly differently in this equation over here. So, instead of t, I have taken k. Uh, and um, okay, so let us see how this looks like. So, if I write this equation over here, this will basically look as follows. So, v x of k, note that in my case I took t plus delta t, in this case I am taking k because I am doing a k minus delta t in the other place. So, v x of k is nothing but v x of k minus delta t, all right plus acceleration x times k times delta t. All right, this is the same as this equation x, except that I have used a slightly different notation over here and here. Okay. So, we will not be using this notation so much. This is the kind of notation which you will see when you write your code uh, and I will show you this a little bit later. For our discussion now, we will use this notation. We will come back to this when I explain the code to you. So, this is how you compute the acceleration, uh, uh, the velocity from the given acceleration, all right. Now, how would we compute the position? 
uh, in exactly the same way that we have looked at the uh, at the computation of the velocity e equation. So, now that we know what is the current velocity uh, which we have computed by using the acceleration measurement, we are just going to repeat the same process for computing the position and that is again follows the same rule that dx by dt is nothing but v uh, x the velocity. So, this basically would say if I write this in the notation of k's, uh, it basically says x of k uh, plus uh, oh, let us do it. So, x of k uh, is, is nothing but x of k minus delta t the previous computed position plus the current um, velocity which I have computed from integrating the acceleration before times the, the delta t. Okay? So, this is the previous computed position this is the current computed velocity. Uh, let me recall the previous equation of uh, how we computed the, the velocity. Uh, so, there we had v of k uh, was equal to v of k minus delta t plus a c c x of k times delta t. So, in that case again as we are seeing now, say, so this was the previous computed velocity, right? this is the current measured acceleration by the accelerometer, the current measured acceleration by the accelerometer. So, this would be uh, step 1, this would be step 2. So, you first compute the velocity based on the previous known velocity and the current acceleration. Then having the value of this velocity, now you plug this into this equation for computing the position. So, the current position is now e equal to the previous computed position plus the current computed velocity times delta t okay? and that is basically this expression over here. So, this will just be x of k equal to x of k minus delta t plus um, that was wrong, we are going to take the velocity plus velocity which is computed at time k times delta t. Right? So, these are my dead reckoning equations which basically follows from the mathematical principle that if I double integrate the acceleration I get position. To do that in a computer you need to first integrate it once to get velocity, integrate that the second time to get position. So, these are the equations we are going to be using in our microcontroller programming uh, which I will show you tomorrow uh, to compute the actual uh, position. So, this is the translation position because we using the accelerometer data. What happens when we uh, use the gyroscope data? If you want to visualize this just think of this as let us say there is a disk over here and it is spinning along this axis. Okay? So, the disc will have some inertia, it will have some mass and so on and you, you apply a torque on this disc and you rotate it. Right? Uh, say for example, I have connected a motor uh, over here and I am continuously ro rotating the disc and here if I place a gyroscope at this location it is going to measure the angular ro rotation rate in the units of degrees per second. Right? That is what the angular ro ro rotation rate is. Now, uh, what I want to compute is the angular position at every instant of time I want to know where this disk is. I want to know whether I have rotated 5 degrees or 10 degrees and so on given the measurement is angular uh, velocity. So, of course, by basic physics we know that integration of angular velocity is nothing but angular position and we use exactly the same story as before since d theta by dt along the x axis of course is omega x. I uh, will rewrite this in the time in the discrete time domain uh, which we get after sampling the angular velocity data from the gyroscope. So, this will basically become theta x at 
the sample number k is the previous computed uh, angular angular displacement so k minus delta t plus the current measured angular velocity okay which comes in from my gyroscope times delta t okay and that's exactly what we have over here okay so this is actually should be delta t it's more a computer notation which i have used over there so this will come to later when we're looking at the code we'll consider this e equation for now okay so we see again this is a first order difference equation uh, because we only had a first order differential equation uh, over here all right so in both the cases uh, for the accelerometer and the gyroscope we compute the first order difference equations uh, in order to get uh, the angular position and the angular uh, and the translatory position all right so that's done and uh, now of course we we have a slightly different um, uh, issue which is basically that each sensor as I have said before is a three axis sensor. So, what this specifically means is that let us consider an accelerometer. So, uh, again I have explained this very very briefly before and let us say that you have a vehicle uh, let us say a car or something like that <clears throat> it is a pretty uh, uh, ugly car. but that is good enough for our story. Uh, so, let us say you have a car and it is moving, it is it's moving on a terrain, right? it is not a straight road, it is moving on a, on a terrain like an off road vehicle in, in the Himalayas or somewhere. Um, and let us say we have these axes which we denote with x, y and z. Now, if it is moving on only one in only one direction, in only one axis, say it is a perfectly flat road. So, let us say it is moving only along the x direction the three axis accelerometer which can be visualized like this. So, this will be one axis, the other axis and the third one uh, each one is orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. So, this three axis accelerometer will measure the acceleration of the car only in the direction in which it is moving right. So, it will not measure uh, this direction uh, the acceleration measurement will be 0 in this direction it will also be 0 in this direction all right it measures only in the forward direction in which it is moving. Similarly, if it is just moving left and right say a plane or, or a helicopter moving left and right uh, along the along this axis over here right. So, along this axis it actually gives me a non zero acceleration, but along the forward axis it will it will show 0 along the vertical along the vertical axis it will show 0 right. If you move in a combination of two different directions both the x and the y axis uh, measurement of the acceleration will show non-zero values. If it moves in 3D all three axes will show non-zero values okay. So, that is what an accelerometer measures. A gyroscope in a similar way again has so I can call this as ACC along x, ACC along y, ACC along z, a gyroscope will measure the angular rotation rate along um, with respect to an axis. I will give a brief idea of that now. So, <clears throat> let us say, so let us say that I have um, my three axis sensor ok. We will uh, call this the one pointing uh, say pointing towards you as a forward axis. The one pointing to the right as one axis and, and the vertical axis completes uh, the orthogonal system or the perpendicular axis system. So, I have got three axes all perpendicular to each other. Now, let us say I take the system and I rotate it about this axis all right. How would I rotate it about the forward axis? I keep the forward axis fixed and I rotate it right. So, you, you can see the motion over here. So, this motion is an angular rotation about the forward axis. What about a rotation about um, say the right side axis the x uh, the y axis. So, I keep this one fixed and I rotate it this way right. So, this is an angular rotation about this axis. Finally, I keep this fixed and I rotate it over here. This is another rotation about this axis. 
So, we have 3 rotations and the rotations are measured with respect to each of the axis. So, it would look like this. So, I have a rotation about the x axis or I can have a rotation about the y axis or rotation about the z axis or you can have a combination of a rotation. So, it, it need not just be a rotation like this or a rotation like this, it can be a rotation like this right and that is a combination of all 3 rotations. Okay. When you take all of these then uh, basically what you will get basically what you will get are these 3 equations uh, in the computer in, in the discrete time case. right? So, this is uh, the computed position along the x direction assuming we have computed the velocity along x, we have the position along y, position along z. Okay? And similarly, we have the angular uh, position along x, angular position along y, angular position along z after we have made the measurements along x, y and z, angular velocity measurements. Uh, for those of you who either watched lots of movies or played some nice video games like flight simulators and those or read some crazy novels, uh, you may immediately recognize that these 3 angular positions are very commonly known as the roll, the pitch and the yaw. All right? We will see this in the next slide. So, um, just a small terminology, the word attitude in navigation it does not refer to good attitude or bad attitude, it refers to these 3 angles we are talking about the roll angle, the pitch angle and the yaw. Okay? And note that each of these angles is a, is a rotation about one specific axis. So, for example, uh, the roll angle is usually called as the rotation about the forward axis. So, I keep the forward axis fixed and I roll my vehicle. right? If I keep uh, the side axis fixed and I pitch up and down, you know, so the pilot who is sitting in the plane, uh, they pull on the, um, you can call it the joystick, they pull on the joystick and the plane pitches up. You push it down, it pitches down. right? The final one is a rotation about the z axis, this is actually the heading or the yaw. So, so you keep it over here and um, you ask the plane to move uh, to change the direction to the right. So, it rotates to the right, left it rotates to the left about this axis. Okay? So, that is roll, pitch and yaw and you can see the small illustration over here. Uh, so, you mount your sensor at this place. The uh, the gyroscope and this is the forward axis, uh, this is the vertical down axis as it is called and this is the right axis which completes the orthogonal um, axis system. Okay? So, whenever you talk of roll, you typically talk of uh, the aircraft rolling with respect to the forward axis. As you can see, my forward axis is not moving. Uh, when you talk of pitch, this axis does not move, uh, so it is just a rotation like this and the same for the yaw. Uh, this does not apply only to uh, aircraft, it applies to cars as you can see over here because cars, uh, especially off-road cars when they move on uneven terrains, uh, you have a roll, pitch and a yaw. As many of you would have experienced if you um, take a car ride through let us say Bangalore's amazing roads filled with potholes, you, you often you know you go into these kind of roll pitch and yaw. And of course, this applies to all uh, all movement, uh, you can talk of human movement. right? So, as I am standing here with respect to you, I, I may be uh, doing a yaw, I may, be, I may be doing a pitch up, my hand may be doing a combination of angular rotations and so on. Every one of this can be measured by the use of a gyroscope. Okay? Fine. Now, attitude, okay? so the roll pitch yaw. Attitude is good, but um, sometimes attitude is not good and there is always a problem with attitude. Well, let us see um, what is the problem with attitude over here. Actually, it is not just attitude, I need to be more precise. 
attitude as well as the translational position or translational movement you can call it. Okay, so let us say that one of you cool uh, people are lying on a beach you know wearing some dark shades and you are just looking up at the sky and you see a nice aeroplane flying across over here all right and um, you know there is this friend of yours who is sitting in another part of the of the town or the city and you want to call up this guy and say hey look man I saw this amazing uh, the LCA Tejas aircraft you know India's own um, fighter combat plane brilliant stuff. Now this guy is going to ask so the guy uh, who is sitting in the town he is going to ask his friend dude where did you actually see this plane. Now this guy is going to say I saw the plane let us say approximately 2 kilometers above me. Uh, this guy has no clue what it means by 2 kilometers above him he does not know where he is right. So the guy in the town does not know where the guy on the beach is he does not know what 2 kilometers above him means especially if uh, this guy is sitting on top of a mountain and this guy is on the beach at almost at the sea level. So he has no uh, clear idea of where the plane actually is with respect to him. The person on the beach knows where the aircraft is but the person here based on the information which the beach uh, dude has given him he is unable to configure or figure out where exactly the aircraft is. There is a further problem you have the aircraft shown over here okay. Now of course we need um, the aircraft flight control system needs to be able to, uh, to compute its own position. So it, it places these gyroscopes, accelerometers and all these things in the aircraft. Now where does it place it? Let us say for example uh, it has placed it let us use a different color white. Let us say it has placed it over here okay. So this box it is actually a very small box is placed over here and uh, this box is actually going to do the measurements of angular rotations as well as accelerations the IMU. Now what is the problem with this as you can see the aircraft axis is shown over here with the roll the pitch and the yaw and aircraft axis is typically defined with respect uh, with respect to the center of mass of the aircraft or, or the center of gravity of the aircraft. The IMU in this case is placed at a slightly different location and it is not aligned with the aircraft axis. So if the aircraft axis is, is like this the IMU axis could be like this right because it depends how I have placed my aircraft. So if this is an aircraft very bad example I, I agree if this is an aircraft let us say this is the IMU okay. If I place it perfectly aligned with the axis of the aircraft that is good. But because of uh, various reasons I have placed it like this and the axes are completely misaligned okay. So in that case the axis of the IMU will be like this that would be the forward axis this would be uh, the pitch axis if you want to call it and that would be the vertical axis and you can see the two axes are not aligned at all which means the IMU which measures the aircraft uh, acceleration and angular velocity it is measuring it in its own frame of reference right the three axes of the accelerometer with respect to these three axes it is telling the aircraft is, is rotating about a certain uh, degrees per second. But the aircraft is in a different axis representation so the aircraft is in this axis representation the IMU is in a different axis representation all right. So you essentially have now a bigger problem a guy uh, the pilot in the aircraft if she or he looks at the data coming from the IMU. So let us say the data coming from the IMU is displayed on the screen of the pilot and it is saying that look man uh, let us say your pitch angle okay, is currently going like this. Now the pilot is not really sure if this is correct or not because this pitch angle is measured by the sensor and it is not the same as the pitch actual pitch angle of the aircraft because it is in a slightly different position. For all you know 
if this is on my left hand, uh, this is the aircraft axis, the right hand is the uh, sensor axis. The way that uh, the designers mount the sensor on the plane, it could be completely 90 degree shifted. So, the pitch axis becomes a roll axis, roll axis becomes a pitch axis. So, when the pilot is, lo is looking at the data from the pitch over here, it is actually the roll axis of the aircraft and if the pilot has to make a decision based on that, uh, it can be catastrophic. So, this is a problem with reference frames, the problem with attitude, problem with translation movement. Every object uh, which measures uh, movement measures it in its own frame of reference, its own axis or coordinate system. The actual system, uh, the plane or a robot or a human walking is uh, experiencing motion in its own reference system. Okay? So, typically you have the system which could be a plane or a fancy robot. Uh, a human being walking and so on, this has its own frame of reference, its own coordinate system. This is called the body reference frame, it is called the body reference frame. A sensor which is mounted on the body okay, to measure the motion of the body or you can actually say there is a camera over there and it is capturing my movement. The camera is recording my movement or the sensor on my body is recording my movement in its own reference frame called the sensor frame. And then you have an observer um, like you or me standing outside and just you know watching this cool plane flying above, then you have an observer frame. Now with three different frames, how are you going to say the aircraft is exactly there? or the robot is exactly over here, you know autonomous uh, robots which are wandering all over the place uh, like this terminator movies. How would you say that the terminator is right over here? Uh, you can only do that if there is a standard reference frame and this is actually a very important problem in robotics, in ship and aircraft navigation, human movement, everything every movement must be expressed with respect to a standard reference frame. It cannot be expressed uh, with respect to uh, his reference frame or her reference frame. It should be with respect to a standard reference frame which everyone understands. Okay? However, measurements are done in the sensor frame. The body is moving in its own frame. The observer has his own frame. So, what we will need to do is Whatever measurements are done in the sensor frame, we need to translate it uh, or we need to transform it into uh, the standard reference frame. Whatever the body is experiencing, transform that into the standard reference frame. Then you know exactly what is happening to the motion of the object. All right. Um, so, this is the problem which I have been talking <clears throat> for the last 2 3 minutes. <clears throat> And the way that uh, people address this problem in navigation is when a sensor measures you know the acceleration and angular velocity in all three axes, uh, we transform the measurements usually first into the body frame, into the aircraft or to the robot. So, we know exactly what is the measurement of the aircraft movement. We do not care what the sensor is experiencing really, we care what the aircraft is experiencing. Um, specifically the movements. right? So, we transform the sensor measurements into the coordinate system of the aircraft or the robot or the human being who is walking. Once you are in the body frame, of course, your uh, body frame is different from his body frame, right? Uh, it is uh, uh, the body coordinate system is different from his, his body coordinate system. So, you need to now transform it into the standard reference frame. Okay? So, for each of these transformations you have something called a rotation matrix. So, apply the rotation matrix and you actually go from one reference frame to another reference frame. Okay? We will see now uh, one simple example of how to actually do the, ref, uh, the rotation matrix then we will go to the complex 3D case. Okay? So, let us see how we can do this reference frame uh, transformation. We will start with a very simple, uh, simple example, but let us frame the question properly. So, the question would actually be, 
given a motion which is measured in one reference frame, let us say it is the sensor reference frame, okay, how would you represent this motion in another reference frame, uh, let us say the body reference frame, All right, so that is the basic question which we are asking. Okay, um, we will actually pose the question as follows. So, given a motion which is measured in one reference frame, how would we represent it in another reference frame? Uh, we always have to keep track of two quantities, one is the translation, uh, the other is the rotation. We will focus primarily on the rotation over here, I will briefly explain how to take care of the translation afterwards. Okay, so we have two reference frames as you can see here, the sensor reference frame and the body reference frame, we need to represent one in terms of the other. Let us take a very simple 2D example, okay. And in this 2D example, I will assume I have got a, a vehicle and the center of gravity of the vehicle is over here with the axis as follows. So, I will call this x body axis and y body axis. Now, what I have done is to mount uh, IMU uh, at exactly at the center of gravity of the vehicle. Now, usually this will not be the case and if it is not the case, you need to take care of the translation part as well. If you mount it exactly at the center of gravity of the vehicle, you only have a rotational problem which is what we will deal with here. So, let us say we mount the sensor like this okay? and the sensor origin coincides with the origin of the uh, of the of the body coordinate system, except that the se sensor is misaligned, okay, with respect to uh, the body coordinate system. So the sensor coordinate system will be like this, okay. I'll call this as uh, well. Let me rewrite that a little bit. I will. call this as x sensor and this is y sensor. So, you can see that the two origins are perfectly aligned, there is only a difference in uh, the rotation between the two sensors and it is in intuitively very clear already by now to, uh, to most of you, all you need to do is to merely rotate uh, the sensor reference frame by a certain angle to match with uh, the body reference frame, alright and that is exactly what the 2D example is all about. So, um, let us say that in the sensor reference frame, the x s and y s, I have said with respect to the origin of course, uh, we, we can call it 0 comma 0, it does not really matter, it can be any x comma y, uh, uh, because the two origins are perfectly aligned. Now, with respect to the origin, let us say I have measured a certain motion, which is over here and this could be acceleration, it could be angular velocity, whatever it is depending on whether I am using an accelerometer or a gyroscope over here, any one of the sensors you can assume. And you see that any point in this is a measurement with coordinates and it can be called as x s 1 and y s 1, okay. What is x s 1 and y s 1 with respect to the origin? It is simply a vector, right, basic basic high school physics. So, this is the measurement which is done. I need to now take this vector uh, which is the sensor measurement x s 1 and y s 1 and I need to transform this into the body reference frame because I want to know in my body reference frame what is the measurement which I am seeing. I do not care what is, is in the sensor reference frame, I want to know in my body reference frame. So, given this how do I transform it into the body reference frame? Very simple. So, we have the two, uh, this is the sensor reference frame and then you have um, the body reference frame, right, x b and y b, this is x s, y s. Now, you need to know only one important quantity in the 2D example, only one quantity which is what is the angular displacement between 
the two reference frames. That's all. I mean, it, it's intuitively clear to all of you by now what it is that that we need. So, if we know what is this angular difference, okay, let's just call it theta. If you are able to measure this theta, we know exactly what we need to do. Well, let's say our gyroscope is actually able to measure this theta, or or we know from a third uh, sensor, or we have manually measured it ourselves that the two axes are slightly deviated with respect to theta and you can actually measure this right. So, you can actually put uh, some sensors over here and you can say that there is a angular displacement between these two reference frames. Once you know that you are just going to do the following. So, given x sensor 1 and y sensor 1 okay, I want to express this in my body coordinates. Right. I want to know what is x body 1, x uh, y body 1 and the way you would do it is really simple. Uh, you would actually do it as follows. So, x body 1 would be nothing but x sensor 1 times cos theta, y body 1 would be nothing but y sensor 1 sin theta and how do you express this as a matrix? Very simple. So, I would just put cos theta over here 0 0 sin theta that is it. So, when you do this now I have a measurement in sensor frame. Now, I am able to express the measurement the sensor measurement in the body frame. Brilliant, simple straightforward in the 2D case. The 3D case becomes a little bit tricky, but it is almost the same logic. How we do that? Well, as follows. In the 3D case note that you can have a rotation uh, about all 3 axes. So, if you look at the previous slide, we basically said that there was a rotation of theta degrees about the x axis which means even the y axis will also be theta degrees rotated with respect to the other y axis right. So, uh, what I am basically saying is if this is theta degrees over here by the property of orthogonality or perpendicularity this will also be theta degrees exactly the same because both axes are uh, orthogonal for both the reference frames. Not true for uh, 3 axis system it is a little bit more involved. And the reason it is a little bit more involved is as follows, two reference frames let us take uh, the forward axis okay, this one over here and let us say uh, that um, you have a slight yaw of the second reference frame, yaw is a rotation about the vertical axis right. So, the vertic about the vertical axis the second reference frame is slightly yawed. Okay, by some angle gamma. Now, because it is 3D this is not the only case which we can have. About this axis over here which I am showing with my left finger about this axis I have a slight pitch okay, with respect to this guy uh, over here and now I still have a third axis left uh, the forward axis the roll axis I have a slight displacement with that. So, I actually have to now consider 3 angles because my axis can be misaligned with respect to this axis in 3 different ways. I can have a yaw displacement, I can have a pitch displacement and a roll displacement. All 3 conditions have to be considered. It is not difficult, it is fairly straightforward you just need to uh, use the, the correct math. Again uh, we take the same example of the sensor frame and the body frame, but please remember you can use this for any 2 frames. Okay? So, the assumptions I am making here is that the sensor frame and the body frame have the same origins. So, in that case, okay, so we have this origin over here, the two reference frames. 
because we have three possible angular displacements between the uh, the two reference frames we are going to consider each angular angular displacement independently. So, first uh, in this particular example I am taking uh, we will assume that the sensor frame is rotated by an angle gamma right over here okay, with respect to the body frame with respect to the z axis of the body frame. Okay. Um, turns out if you do the math properly because uh, when we are doing a rotation about the z axis notice that the bottom uh, one is fixed. So, when you ro rotate about the z axis okay, the third component which is the z axis component will all be zeros except the z axis itself because the z axis is fixed it is not moving it is the other two axes which are moving. right? The other two axes by standard trigonometric re relationships will follow this relationship. Now, you do not need to worry about the derivations of this. Um, maybe those of you who are going for higher studies you can uh, study this later not uh, not too relevant for now. It is important to know that if I want to go from the sensor frame to a frame called B 1 uh, which is body frame 1 where the z axis are now aligned. So, remember I had three misalignments um, a misalignment about the z axis misalignment about the y axis that is a pitch axis and about the roll. L let me correct these one by one. So, first let me correct the z axis. So, I do a rotation about the z axis this one over here. So, that rotation I do first. The second rotation which I will show in the next slide will be about the pitch axis. So, I will do like this and the third rotation will be about the roll axis. So, I am going to do this step by step. So, about the z axis if you if you blindly go ahead and use this expression okay, this is called the rotation matrix and this rotation matrix helps you in this example to align ah, sorry about that it helps you to align the two z axis of the two reference frames of the two reference frames that is all what it does. So, which means that if I have a vector uh, my measurement x s y s z s in the sensor frame uh, this I can use this rotation matrix and bring it to the body frame where the z axis of the two reference frames are aligned we still have to take care of the other two reference frames. So, this is step 1. Step 2 let us say that uh, your body frame was now rotated by some theta about the x axis. Okay. In the previous case it was gamma about the y axis now theta about the x axis. Okay. Uh, in this case again since it is about the x axis x axis will always remain all terms will be 0 and x axis itself will be fixed. So, it will always be 1 and we look at uh, the rotations in the other two components and it has a very similar structure as as the previous one. So, this is again my rotation matrix and notice what it is doing in the previous example we had this rotation matrix with the notation R s b 1 which means it is a rotation or a transformation from the sensor frame s to the sensor frame b 1 where the z axis are aligned. In this slide we have R b 1 to R b 2 this is a rotation from b 1 re reference frame to b 2 reference frame where the z axis is aligned as before and now we are aligning the x axis as well. So, now two axes are aligned and you can see that over here right both the axis the z and the x are aligned. Uh, you after you apply the rotation uh, and again this is a standard expression. So, the measurement in body frame 1 where the z axis were aligned is now transformed to a measurement in body frame 2 where x and z are both aligned okay. that you can see in this slide after the previous two transformations the z and the x are now aligned with the respective reference frames and what is left out is the y axis. 
So, uh, let us say you had the angular displacement uh, by beta with respect to the new y axis do exactly the same thing as we have done before. So, we have had from the sensor frame to body frame 1 after this we have done body frame 1 to body frame 2 in this case we align the z axis in this case we have aligned the z axis and the x axis and now finally we look at the rotation between the two y axis of say body frame to the final correct body frame b2 to b and now all three axes will get aligned x axis z axis and the y axis and you can see that over uh, in the next slide. So, when you rotate this by uh, the appropriate angle all three axes will be perfectly aligned with each other right. So, like so and this is a ro this is a rotation to go from uh, B 2 to B the second body axis to the final body axis and interestingly all you need to do in order to do this very complex sounding mathematical description is very is one very simple operation. Take the three rotation matrices and multiply them in this specific order on the right hand side from the sensor frame to body frame 1 that is one rotation matrix multiply that with body frame 1 to body frame 2 the second rotation matrix and finally, multiply that result with the body frame 2 to the actual body frame the third rotation matrix. You actually do that multiplication and you get this horrible looking expression which you do not need to worry about considering you are an undergraduate student you can actually use this as it is and this follows from very basic trigonometric rules and really nothing nothing more than that ok. So, the interested student can uh, contact me or um, on the forum NPTEL forum or you can look up in Google to find out uh, how you actually derive these expressions ok. Now, this means so this formula what it actually means is this it means that any measurement I do in the sensor frame. So, I can call it x s y s z s any measurement done in uh, the sensor frame if I multiply it with this rotation matrix I will exactly get what the actual measurement is in the body frame. Now, the body and the sensor frame are aligned they know exactly uh, what they are both talking about like where the vehicle actually is when you just multiply with this which is this matrix all right. Um, now, note that I have talked only about rotation I have not talked about um, I have not talked about translation well translation is slightly slightly different um, it is even simpler. So, let us say that you have two rotation frames uh, like this and a second rotation frame over here origins are not aligned. that is the basic difference between the example considered here and the example I am now considering well how to handle this really simple. So, this example we will write down over here and it is really really straightforward how we are going to do this is as follows. So, again we have the measurement in the sensor frame uh, z s ok the first thing we are going to do is to align the rotation axis ok. So, by multiplying with our matrix which we have already computed after doing that we shift ok. So, I will actually draw this over here this is one sensor axis ok and this was the other sensor axis uh, the body axis let us say ok. Now, what we are going to do when we apply R s to B this axis over here ok it gets shifted displaced rather angularly displaced to this axis ok. So, now the angles at which the two reference frames are, are being considered in are exactly the same what is missing is I need a translation from here to here I need to go 
I need to shift the origin from this place to that place. Now, let us not worry how that is actually calculated. Let us say someone actually tells you by measurement. So, you have your car and this is the center of gravity and you have placed your, uh, so it is in some x, y, z body position origin and you have placed your IMU over here, you can physically just measure it, right. So, you know that uh, uh, this is some x1, y1, z1 where you have placed your sensor and you know the difference between x and x1, you know the difference between y and y1, z and z1. Subtract out those differences and all you need to do is to add that small difference. So, uh, I will call it x difference in the translation position, y difference in the translation position, z difference in the translation position. If you add this to the rotated values, you are going to get perfectly x b, y b, z b. So, first take care of the rotation between the two axes, then align the origins. Done. You are essentially done three dimensional inertial navigation. So, let me try to summarize uh, this entire story which we have been talking about, which may seem a little bit complex when you encounter it the first time. Um, if you go through this two or three times, it is actually fairly simple. Uh, all we are doing is really just trigonometry in 3D. Okay? So, let me just try to summarize it as neatly as possible. So, the, the problem was as follows. So, given two reference frames, uh, le let us call this as the body frame okay? and another reference frame is the sensor reference frame. Now, we know that a measurement is always done in the sensor reference frame. The sensor measures values with its own three axis reference frame, which needs to be converted to the body measurement frame. Okay? And then of course, we need to convert the body measurement frame to the standard reference frame, but we will come to that later. So, how do we actually do this? Well, uh, as we have seen, there are two steps. The first is align the axis rotations. Okay? Align the axis of the two reference frames that is so if you align the axis of the two uh, reference frames even though they are widely separated from each other. So, as you can see this is angularly different fr from this one, let us first align them together. All right. Now, to align them, you only need that one R S to B matrix, you know that big um, 3 cross 3 matrix which you had. You only need 3 angles as you saw there was a gamma, a theta and what was the last one, a beta. So, if you have these 3 angles, you can actually align the reference frames together, uh, angularly align them. How do you compute these, uh, uh, these gamma, theta and beta? There are various techniques. Uh, for our case, let us actually suppose that we do it manually. So, as I said before, you have a vehicle with the center of gravity over here and uh, the sensor mounted over here with its axis like this. All we need to do is to find out uh, what is the angular displacement between these two things. All right. uh, there is a bunch of ways of doing it, but we can just literally do it manually. Take, I mean, if you are really lazy, just take a protractor and try to align them, and that's, that will be reasonably accurate. All right. If you want very high degree of accuracy, there are really fancy techniques, but uh, let us not worry about that. So. Uh, all you had to do was to compute the RSB matrix and then multiply uh, the vector, the sensor measurement that you do with the RS to B uh, matrix. Then you get the measurement in the, uh, in the body coordinates with axis aligned. So, this is the 
axis angularly aligned body coordinates. It is still not aligned in the translation way for that all you need to do is to just compute this guy. So, if you know the uh, x 1, y 1, b 1 of the body and you know the x 2, y 2, b 2 of the sensor, it is again very easy to do. Um, the easiest way to do it without actually breaking your head too much is to assume the body axis origin is 0, 0, 0. Just assume it is 0, 0, 0, no worries. You compute the displacement along the x direction of the body to see where the sensor is. So, if the body is over here, uh, let us say this is the origin, all right, origin of the sensor. You basically just go along the x direction and, and you measure and you get the displacement delta x with respect to the sensor, the x displacement. Same thing do with y. So, keep going until you see what is that y and the same thing with z. Then all you need to do is to add the delta x, delta y, delta z. This is the displacement, the translation displacement between the origins of the axis. And once you do all that, you get a completely aligned uh, reference frames and whatever you measure in the sensor axis, now you know it is exactly the same as what you actually have in the body axis. Okay? That is a basic principle. You are free to contact me if you want specific code for this, uh, if you want more explanation literature about all this, you are free to contact us on the forum. Okay. Um, while this is <clears throat> fairly simple, uh, there are uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there are many, too many reference frames uh, w which are actually in use. Uh, so, while we like to say that uh, there is one standard reference frame, it really depends on what your purpose is. If you are on earth, one, one of the standard reference frame is called the earth centered inertial reference frame, uh, where the origin of the reference frame is the center of mass of the earth and one axis points towards north, other axis point towards the vernal equinox and the third one just completes the right angle triangle along the equator. So, this is one reference frame. So, anywhere you are on earth, right? can I see India here? No, I cannot see in the map, but okay. anywhere you are on earth, you can define your position with respect to uh, these three axes and actually this is what will give you the standard latitude, longitude and altitude measurements. But this is if a vehicle is on earth, but for a satellite you have a different reference frame altogether and one of them is called the orbital coordinate system. If you are inside a room like the one that I have, it really makes um, no point to worry about uh, orbital coordinate system and for very specific applications, you may not even care about earth centered reference, uh, earth centered inertial frame. You may just literally worry about this room axis. How do you uh, define the room axis? I can just take one corner of the room, I go down where all the walls are meeting at one corner and I can define that to be the origin. Okay? So, reference frames are um, very important and it is up to you to, to decide what reference frame you want. Uh, you can choose a reference frame of this room, assume your robot is navigating within this room, its only job is to worry about what it is doing in this particular room. A person outside who wants to monitor the robot is also interested in what the robot is doing in the room. We do not really care if this room is in Chennai or Bangalore or Mumbai or wherever, right? it is enough for us to know that in this room uh, the, the robot is doing its job properly. For that you just need a room reference frame, I can take the axis over here and, and then define it. If you are going from, um, uh, actually I am planning a trip from Chennai to Mahabalipuram uh, tomorrow because you know I am visiting Chennai from Bangalore. Then my room reference frame is of is of no use. My car reference frame is of no use. I really need a earth-centered inertial reference frame. I need a GPS kind of reference frame. The the latitude, longitude, altitude. That's more relevant for me. 
So, what you use, how you use is up to your task. In all cases, the way that you would compute, uh, uh, the way that you would express a motion in one reference frame in another reference frame is exactly by the story which you have described. Uh, this was the basic uh, uh, story of say navigation where we discussed different navigation techniques. We looked at very briefly what is dead reckoning which was basically the integration process and we represented that integration process with a difference equation uh, which is going to be implemented in a microcontroller and finally we concluded with reference frames. In the next lecture uh, what I will be talking about is um, one of the most important uh, or the most important problem in uh, dead reckoning, it is a problem called drift and we will see that drift arises because of certain noise characteristics of sensors and very briefly I will introduce uh, one or two techniques of how we can remove uh, this noise in order to get a better computation or estimation of position. All right. And we will finally conclude with a very nice detailed experimental uh, example right here. Uh, my research associate Vinay Sridhar will actually be taking care of that. All right. Thank you very much.